that prepared your will, please listen carefully. Without a will, the laws of the state and not you will determine who receives your property and in what amounts, who manages the affairs of your estate. Your choice as guardian of your minor children may never be known. Your loved ones could face unnecessary legal costs and needless court delays. Now, for only $9.95, you can make your own will, quickly and safely, with the American Will Kit. You'll receive simple, fill-in-the-blank will forms with easy-to-follow directions. The forms were prepared by lawyers to be valid in all 50 states. Order now, and you'll also receive, free of charge, our easy-reading personal protection guide, giving you important tips and special information that can save you money. Join the more than one million Americans who have already taken advantage of this special mail order opportunity. To order, call toll-free 1-800-821-2100. That's 1-800-821-2100. Only $9.95 plus shipping. Call now, 1-800-821-2100. Money back if not satisfied. It just seems to be against um, what most of us have been taught at our mother's knee in the Christian principles, confrontation. We're supposed to turn the other cheek, uh, kind of uh, kick me in the face for Jesus. But uh, you don't get very far, particularly in the area of politics that way. If you'd like to ask Bill Richardson, senator from California, state of California, about uh, confrontational politics, etc., give us a call at one 800 Three five one one two one two, and up in Earlsboro, Oklahoma. Hi, Pat. Hi. Hi. I have a question. I got the. I believe it's called the McIlvany Report. Mm -hmm. I re received it uh, through your program. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was wondering. It said that Bush was a very dangerous man, and we know that we can't. We couldn't elect or couldn't vote for um, the other two, Dukakis and, Je and Jesse Jackson. Where do we stand? Good question, Bill. Well, one thing I try to get across to people is that, fortunately, you don't have just one person to vote for in the United States. We have a system of government that is so spread out and so uh, uh, spread out that a lot of the power resides in your states and in your Congress and the United States Senate. So there's always alternatives on, on where we put our energies. One of the things that I think we have, problem we have in the United States, we've concentrated so much on the presidency that we've forgotten that the foundation of how he operates is predicated by the United States Congress. Each and every one of us can do little to affect the outcome of a national election, but we can do a heck of a lot to affect what happens and who resides in the local congressional seat, which could have an effect a longer range impact. I'm spending this election more time working on young men in Congress than I am worrying about the presidential elections. That, to me, the presidential thing this year will be an afterthought. It really will. I have three young men that I have a chance in California to help put in office who will be there 20 years, uh, longer than any one man will ever serve in the presidency. In fact, in probability, longer than any three of them will ever serve. We so still, we I still have a long-range impact. Know that you have multiple choices. We still have, uh, we still have the problem, Bill. Uh, as, as one writer said, some Republicans would uh, hold their nose and go vote for the Republican ticket and not get involved. Uh, the choices this year may not be as clear as they have. Well, they're not, and it's and it's not only not as clear. That still doesn't make it mean that you don't make a choice. Yeah. But it does mean that you try to you try to, to pick the best you can mm -hmm. and be perfectly willing to go out and beat up on the guy that you've helped elect if he doesn't mm -hmm. stay in line. Hold his feet to the fire. Yes, that's right. But the way to how do you the question then is posed, Marlon? How do you hold a guy's feet to the fire politically? Yeah. And that is by being a part of structure. Mm -hmm. which is perceived to be good politically. In other words, being a active, being active more than just being a letter writer, being a organizer around a single issue, finding things with which you agree, which you can participate. And, and people have to understand the power of these single interests if they're well organized. Uh, the the, the anti-abortion people are getting very sophisticated if that's a very, very strong issue for you. Um, uh, national gun organizations have shown an, an unbelievable way of impacting the legislature. The National Rifle Association. There's not a hunter in the world that shouldn't be a member of that organization in the, in the cumulative effect that it has on Washington. So you can have a very, very solid impact by what you join, what you personally do, and how you participate locally. If I could ever direct the American public, I'd say, forget about the presidency. 
you worry about people that you can impact, your congressman, your state senator, your assemblyman, and if you do a good job of making sure good people are there, you'd be surprised what's going to pop out of the top and who's going to wind up representing us on a Washington level. Thank you, Pat. Th this is an issue, Pat, that, uh, that we're going to have to be facing in the next few months, and we'll try to get people from all sides to discuss this. Well, you know, one thing, one thing more. You, you brought up something earlier about the tapes of Dr. Schwartz. Yeah. Okay, these are, these are powerful tapes. See, I, I always look upon a tape as a, as a methodology of informing somebody else. Yeah. It's so easy to give it to a friend and say, hey, hey, take this and plug it into your car when you're driving along. See what you think. And it's our way, it's our outreach. Because I, in my wildest dreams, will never be able to articulate that subject on dialectics as well as Dr. Schwartz. He spent his entire life doing it. So, by the way, uh, Marlon, you, you might find this of interest. I did three one-half-hour tape shows with um, uh, Dr. Schwartz on uh, television. Uh -huh. I've, I've done, uh, I'm going to put together three tapes, three half-hour tapes on mm -hmm. scientific dialectical materialism and uh, have probably in several months have them available. So if anybody wants video on it, I'll hopefully be able to provide that in the relatively near future. Have and you, I might add, not too expensively either. Have you have you got an address? Do you publish oh, a I've newsletter? Been, frankly, I just uh, I'll, I'll put it on your back. Have them write you if they're interested, and then uh, then you and I'll communicate at a later date, and and we'll get a hold of them. We'll do. All right, let's go to Oxford, Mississippi. Jolene, hi. Hi, Marlon. How are you today? Fine. How are you? Yes, I'd like to ask Mr. Richardson a question. I, I found it very interesting what he's talking about today. It's something I'm dealing with here in, in our particular area that you find, uh, particularly in the Republican Party, unfortunately, that they have this eye, their eye, that it's like tunnel vision set on the presidency, and then they re you have to realize Ronald Reagan, although he's been a champion for conservatives, he has done relatively little as far as getting his um, ideas implemented into law and we have to work just as diligently and just as hard for our congressmen on a state level and and do as much as we can for ourselves and our friends to get them into local politics because down the road once they have experience they can get in there and do something and i'd also on the um uh, confrontation issue how does he suggest we deal with that once they withdraw that hammer back and and compromise with us and, well, and make it looking at it from a positive side it's always an advantage to know that your opposition especially when you're dealing with humanists if given pressure will always step backwards it's a wonderful thing to go into a fight knowing that they're part of their nature is to back off the question is at one given point they do that you push them off the road and see, our people tend at that point to start apologizing, accepting compromise, instead mm -hmm. of being mm -hmm. very aggressive and constantly pressuring, pressuring, pressuring ahead. Mm -hmm. Because when we do that, we gain territory that we've lost in the past. Now, there are several things that you can do. Number one, you can take advantage of their forward thrust by diverting it in such a fashion that you take advantage of the issue and build a constituency. Our people don't go into fights with the idea of a residual left over. Mm -hmm. In other words, when I ever get in fights with my dear liberal colleagues, I always make sure that I've got a residual when that fight's over with. I've got people to organize to work with for another attack. That's what we did with Rose Bird in California. We organized off of their efforts, and we took such advantage of them that they're still feeling the pain from it. Thank you, Jolene. Thank you. Bill, uh, I've got about uh, three minutes left. I, I'm, I'm very, if we can, in that length of time, I'm interested in uh, what happened with the Rose Bird. She was a member of the Supreme Court. The, she the Rose Bird situation. Of her colleagues, very, very liberal. In fact, our court was by far and away the most liberal in the United States. And you had her recalled? Now, uh, yes. Well, she had. She was up for reconfirmation, and uh, and and uh, we put together an organized effort by film and uh, and materials that we were capable of handling out handing out, rather, and uh, we defeated her by over one million votes. Not only did we take her out, we took out two of her most liberal colleagues. What was the strategy, and how did you bring it about? Well, first of all, one, one of the strategies, we maintained uh, to totally control of the issue, and by doing that, we thought in advance on how did we frame the issue? How did we want the debate to take place? So what we went out and did, we put together one half-hour film, very, very well thought out, on the, the bird court, and and how they had chosen to, to uh, ignore the people's wishes on the death penalty in the state. We used that as a central theme. We wanted that to be the subject that would be discussed, that they were working against law enforcement. Then we put together district attorneys, law enforcement officials, etc., and other judges, 
in a very, very successful one-half-hour video. And then vis-a-vis -vis, uh, an organization I put together in California called Law & Order Campaign Committee, we reached out and pushed out over 8,500 of those films throughout the state. Well, there wasn't a service club, there wasn't a uh, community group that didn't have an opportunity to see that tape and see it over and over. Local groups sponsored it on their local television stations. And by the time we were through, better than a million and a half people saw our tape on it. You went around the, you went around the media. Yeah, totally around them. Yeah. In fact, what we did when we put the tape together, we called a press conference in Sacramento. They all came, all of the major wires and all the rest of it, and were forced to sit through one half hour as I laid out our presentation. And they then, in turn, reported what a, a you know great new tool this was. And when they gave us about a half million dollars free publicity, mm -hmm. but Rose Bird never gained control of her campaign because we had initiated the manner in which it was to be debated. She then became very defensive. She then uh, uh, started making mistakes and, and started getting mad at the media. And she pushed the media, believe it or not, away from her. Although she had some endorsements of some major newspapers, uh, she didn't have rank and file with her because we had uh, identified the issue so well that it was impossible for her to overcome it. My guest this afternoon, Senator H.L. Bill Richardson. He's a state senator from California. We're going to take five minutes out for news and information, and then uh, the senator will be with us for another half hour. The book of the month, the point of view book of the month, is uh, Dr. Fred Swartz's book, You Can Trust the Communists to Be Communists. Uh, I think it could very well be one of the most vital books of the 1980s and 90s. It's been out a few years, and I'd like to see everybody in the United States read it. And uh, even Senator Bill Richardson has done some videos with uh, Dr. Swartz on the dialectic. We'll talk to him about that down the road when those are available. And if you'd like to get a copy of the book, You Can Trust the Communists to Be Communists, Please write to me and enclose a gift of $3.50 and ask for the book You Can Trust the Communists to Be Communists. I'll also inclu include a pamphlet, Why Communism Kills. That's to Box 30, Dallas 75221. You're listening to Point of View via satellite. This is the USA Radio Network. It's time for the Mike Richards Report, brought to you today by Americans for an Informed Public. Now here's Mike. Folks, as Pat Buchanan, co-host of TV's Crossfire, recently said, if Jesse Jackson can route two senators, Albert Gore and Paul Simon, one representative, Richard Gephardt, one former governor, Bruce Babbitt, and run stronger than ever against Michael Dukakis, governor of Massachusetts, who has ten times Jesse's resources, how can his party rob him of a place on the ticket? Buchanan's right. After achieving all that, to deny Jackson his place would have to be taken by black America as an insult, an act of discrimination. For years, the Democratic Party has consistently managed to corral 90% of the black vote. Now black America has every right to say, okay, our turn has come. Folks, let's see now if those who preach the politics of inclusion practice it. Think about it. Till next time, this is Mike Richards. For a copy of this month's Mike Richards Report, send $2 to Box 1529, Sugarland, Texas, 77487. are listening to Point of View Radio Talk Show, broadcasting to the nation via satellite from Dallas, Texas. For cassette tapes of interviews and other materials offered on Point of View, please write to Marlon Maddox, Post Office Box 30. That's Box 30, Dallas, Texas, 75221. Zip 75221. Please enclose your tax-deductible gift when you write. The opinions expressed on Point of View do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this station. Now, here again is Marlon. Good to have you, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm enjoying a conversation with uh, Senator H.L. Bill Richardson from his office in Sacramento. He's been a state senator for 22 years, and uh, he is an astute What's the word for it? Uh, strategist, tactician. He 
has made a study of politics and the working of politics, and that's what we're talking about today. So if you're involved in a school board election or if you're involved in trying to get homeschooling uh, okayed in your state, if you're involved in Democrat or Republican precinct politics and whatever you're involved in, uh, what the senator's having to say today should be of interest to you. If you'd like to talk to him, give us a call at 1-800-351-1212. Anywhere in the continental United States, Texas or any other place, cross the street if you're calling. And call us 1-800-351-1212. Before I get back to the phones, which are all lit up like a Christmas tree, Bill, one of the problems has always been, particularly with uh, conservatives, they're always on the defensive. And for, let's take, for example, the abortion issue. When you hear a pro-abortion person, they're talking about the woman's right to control her body, talking about the right to privacy, which is the one that sunk Judge Bork. Uh, they always talk about nobody has the right to impose something on me. And conservatives are always on the defensive, trying to answer their objections. So what do we do? Well, let, let's, let's first of all take a look at it mechanically, if we might, Marlon. <clears throat> when a person asks a question, he has, an, uh, he has a time frame advantage on his side because the mind works about uh, two to three times faster than the mouth. So when you ask a question and the other person is sitting there answering, he's got to literally slow his mind down to the speed of his mouth so he can answer. And so he's working at literally a time frame advantage. And while you're waiting, to, you're coming up with an answer, this guy's thinking of three more questions to ask you that keeps you constantly on the defensive. One of the most characteristics about, uh, about our dear liberal friends is their ability to, to pose questions. In fact, there's an old joke on it. This fellow from Massachusetts was once asked, why do you people from Massachusetts always answer a question with a question? His response was, what do you mean we always answer a question with a question? <laughs> you know, and, and when you think about your liberals, that's exactly what they do. Uh -huh. They frame the issue, or they twist it, to, so they're framing the issue, yeah. taking advantage of the conservatives' innate desire to answer directly. Mm -hmm. Our mm -hmm. compulsion is to answer directly right. the questions and be honest asked. about it. Right. So we, by the very framework of having to answer place ourselves in a defensive posture. After a while, we start getting frustrated, you get a little bit mad, and you lose control. That's right. Now, a liberal will do it for two, one or two reasons. To put you in a corner, to get you to shut up so you won't talk about the subject another time, or he'll do it in front of an audience. Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. question then is, how do you respond to something like that? Now, let me give you one of the oldest adages of all of how to frame an issue. If somebody asked the, the standby when did you stop beating your wife? Yeah. The very framing of that question puts you on the defensive. That's right. So if you say, I've never beat my wife, I've never ever attempted to beat my wife, and I have no plan in the future to beat my wife, and my children have never seen me beat my wife, all you've done was repeat his charge four times. Uh-huh. And people are going to say, well, there's smoke, there's fire. The guy right. never would have brought That's it up right. if he didn't yeah. feel that this guy had you know, taken a swipe at the old lady at some time or another. So how, should, I mean? how should he have answered it? So, so, well, the answer is you turn, you don't even answer his question. You say, why do you attack other people's characters as a part of your debate technique? Mm -hmm. So that, he then is now in the position of having to defend his character. I, I, think, maybe, I think maybe George Bush uh, should s score pretty high points with his Dan Rather bit. Well, that's... See, Bush understood a bit the nature of it, and he didn't. Yeah. Let's go back to the Bork hearing. Yeah. Now, here's a typical example yeah. of good, good, sound American Ronald Reagan uh, not willing to, to comprehend or maybe totally understand the nature of the Ted Kennedys and the people on the, on the other side of this issue. Mm -hmm. They posed the major question on Bork that Bork was a racist. That's right. This was one of the very first things. There was absolutely zero substantiation. But you can't but defend our, it. Our response, if I should say, uh, Bork is not a racist. He's never been a racist. I don't know how you can dare call Bork a racist. There's no sign that he's a racist. In fact, we've done five weeks of research showing that there's not a racist bone yeah. in his body. Yeah. Wrong answer. It, nope. it's, it's the old technique of when did you stop beating your wife? So what should they have done? Going into any kind of a confrontational situation, which that was from its inception, 
with people like uh, you know the uh, uh, the Kennedys at all, mm-hmm. you know it's going to be confrontational up front, and that the whole issue should have been framed around Bork's unbelievably sound positions on law enforcement measures. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So anybody that would dare attack Bork would be perceived to be anti-law enforcement. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In other words, you frame the issue going in mm-hmm. that you know what you or points you want to make. And so you establish them in advance and make them argue off of your base. Mm-hmm. Our people don't understand it as a technique. We get we get twisted up because we, we tend to want to answer questions very directly, Marlon. Uh, we tend to uh, hate the idea that uh, we could be put in a defensive posture. And we go into these things expecting to get whipped subconsciously when, in fact, we've got everything in the world on our side. You know, I've never gotten into a debate situation with a left winger ever feeling that I was going to lose because if he knew so much, why isn't he? Why is he liberal? Let, let me ask you. Okay, we got some people listening today, and they've got to go to the uh, they got to go to the school board and the local school. They've got some objections to some of the things in the textbooks. They know what the school board is going to hit them with: censorship, their Neanderthal mentalities. Uh, g- give give me a response for somebody standing there. Well, first of all, everything you do, you do on you you you, you learn to catch things in a more populist way. Okay. Well, why do we fight uh, in the school board issues against this material? It's because we have an interest in our children's uh, future. We have a concern over the well-being of America. We have a, a deep and abiding concern over our children being able to compete internationally with every mm-hmm. other child in the world that's learning. And so we go in with that in mind. Our whole motivation is to the improving of this child. Mm-hmm. And so for those reasons, we have to stand against literature that does to the contrary. Mm-hmm. Put them on the defensive on being non-factual and all the rest of it, mm-hmm. and never let them off of it. Mm-hmm. You see, you've got to learn to keep the debate around what you want to talk about. If You have to keep constantly bringing them back to the points and the manner in which you framed it. So if you get into a discussion, frame it and stay on it. Now, understand another thing. The louder they respond, usually the better you have them. Our people don't understand that when they start to squeak is when we hurt them. I'll tell you what, Lee. ignore you. What? I'll I'll tell you what, Bill. I hope the people will take a good hard look at this presidential race, the questioning by the correspondents in the debates and whatever. We have got some guys that are past masters I tell my wife uh, when one of them is on television, I said, now here's a question. Watch the way he just totally does not answer it. It doesn't matter what it is, they take it as a springboard to go into a political speech. Watch Of course. It. Of course. But that's, that, 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 they're trained and they, they think that way. They don't have any compulsion to answer the question. They've been trained in that, right? Sure. Heck, the, it's, part of their, it's a part of their methodology. Don't, don't they have... It's, it's, since answering, being honest and being truthful and being straightforward, and since it's not a part of their ethics, so they, they have no sense of complying, and they get away with it. Don't they have sessions where they practice that? Of course. <laughs> My guest this afternoon is uh, Senator Bill Richardson, and I'm talking to him from his office in Sacramento, California. May make some of you quit being little whimpering wimps and get out there and do what you know you ought to do. I mean, going to the school board meeting and coming home and crying for three weeks because they called you a nasty old censor and your feelings are hurt so bad. I know you're doing it. You're writing me letters. Get out there and slug it out some more. We're going to talk some more and take your calls after this. Stand by. In a recent survey conducted at Johns Hopkins University, over 29,000 weight loss methods were studied. Fewer than 6% were found to be effective or even safe. The 80-20 medical weight loss plan is different. Developed over a three-year period by a leading physician and clinical dietitian, the 80-20 plan is for people who don't have time to play diet games. Brought to you privately on convenient audio cassette tape format, this uniquely successful life-changing weight control plan is a step-by-step guide to weight loss without hunger, fatigue, or emotional highs or lows. No pills, no powders, no hypnosis, no meetings, no embarrassing public weigh-ins. The 80-20 plan is a breakthrough solution to a difficult, painful, sometimes lifelong problem. To learn more about the 8020 plan, call now. 1 800 444 TAPE. That's 1 800 444 TAPE. Again, 1 800 444 TAPE. 
When you travel, you can save a lot of money by staying at a Regal 8 Inn. But now your room bill could be even lower than the guy in the room next to you. You see, if you call our toll-free number, we'll send you a free coupon for money off your next stay at a Regal 8 Inn. When you stay at a Regal 8 Inn, just present the coupon and we'll give you an immediate discount on your room. It's that easy. You'll get HBO or movies, a swimming pool, a clean, comfortable room, touch-tone phones, even a free cup of coffee every morning. So if you have plans to travel and you'd like to get a discount on the cost of lodging, call for your free Money Off coupon. There's no obligation at all. We'll send you a free directory, too. For your free discount coupon, just call us, 1-800-851-8888. That's 1-800-851-8888. You can relax. There's a Regal 8. one 800 351 your open line to America. Bill, let's go to the phones, and uh, folks, keep your question kind of short. The senator will keep his answer short, and we'll take as many calls as we can. Olean, New York. Hi, Ellen. Yeah, there was uh, some communists on the PBS station last week here. They First, they screen you like the KGB to find out what your call is about. <laughs> He's right. Oh, right. You've got to learn to use uh. your time. They used to interrupt my, if I started making good point for the conservative mm. side, they'd interrupt with, now where do you get your information there from? You, you do this to me every time. Yeah. So now I give an advertisement for a conservative newspaper or for your talk show, and Great. I give the whole address so that any listeners can, can yeah. tune in. I love it. And um, another thing, the, uh, the sneaky political attitude is not just limited to the Democrats. Uh, here in New York, we have a congressman. I've heard a caller from uh, Elmira call into your show and complain about him, Emil Houghton. He owns the Corning Glassworks here. He's really cozying up to the communists, and we are just sick about it because uh, he was supposed to be pro-contra. He voted against them. You know, a very conservative Republican, we believe. Mm-hmm. He even sent a glass cross over, took it over to Russia uh, this last week, uh, thanking them for their religious freedom there, which everybody is complaining about. Uh, one more point. When I call a show, like when they had these communists on, everybody called in. Not, not one single person called in and disagreed with them having them on. Mm-hmm. They called in mm-hmm. and said things like, oh, how polite and nice they were and how friendly and just like us. You know, they really got their propaganda across. Mm-hmm. And when I called in, the operator said, um, uh, you know, started quizzing me. So I said, well, I really believe they want peace. So she let me right on. <laughs> and when I got on, I said, a piece of Nicaragua. Piece of Nicaragua. <laughs> uh, and they were very irritated with me. And now there are three, I'll, I'll say this and hang up. Three conservatives that used to call, I call about every three weeks, mm-hmm. they would call every week and really give them a rough time, two, mm-hmm. two men that were very outspoken. They're never on anymore, so I don't think they've learned how to be a little sneaky about getting on. Good time. Thank you, Ellen. And I, I'd like to encourage the rest of you to call in on the talk shows. If you've got to be a little sneaky, be a little sneaky. Harris well, you don't have to be sneaky. All you just have to do is not say some things. That's right. And understand verbiage. But, that, see, that's the difference. A, a person motivated by a certain moral ethic feels like sidestepping it a little bit. they got to say exactly what they're going to say, to be honest, right? Well, that's, but, but that's, that's, I can see, I'm for peace. I am for, uh, there's probably nobody in this world that has a greater most, more driving desire than I do for peace in the world. And, uh, and there's nobody in the world that wants to see the, 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 the improvement of humanity. And nobody in the world wants to see that the elderly and sick are properly taken care of in the, mm-hmm. in the finest mm-hmm. manner possible. There's nobody in the world that wants to see uh, the services that people can have and be provided for that will take care of them in their old age, etc., 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 the children or, or child abuse or whatever the canes or rape crisis centers. I'm all for, for things that help America. But I just have a different answer on how they're to be accomplished. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. the question is, is knowing how to break through and get into a, into a conversation on it, is knowing how to adopt the populist side. Because the conservative in the United States represents the populist side. Right. <clears throat> you know, we, are, in fact, are the party of the working man. We really are. Right. We're for the people out there who are working for a living, the wage earners who are providing for this country's well-being. I don't see why in the world we can't take, and properly so, 
the populist position because nobody represents the best character of this country than we do. And so why not, why not stand for what we always believe in? And why do we allow the other side to preempt us in these given areas when they don't represent it at all? That's right. Harrisburg, Kentucky. Hi, Gail. Hi. I'll tell you that uh, I think it all started with uh, Senator Joseph McCarthy. And uh, when uh, uh, somebody gave him information that was absolutely right, and, uh, and he trusted his source of information, and then I think that they crucified him and set an example in the Senate for nobody ever to call a communist a communist again, or they'd get the same thing as McCarthy. And I, th I think, now a senator told me that, if he ever mentioned the word communist, he would never get elected mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. So I think that, uh, that uh, they go to the other extreme, not knowingly, but they want to be the mainstream so they can get elected. All right, th this is a good point, uh, Senator. Uh, you know, if you start talking about certain things, they say, hey, that's McCarthyism. Well, that, that, uh, that comes up. And, I, and Well, one thing we have to understand about Joseph McCarthy, and by the way, nobody was more vilified or attacked more than, than he, but Joe McCarthy went into a world he didn't know a lot about. And, and uh, he made some tactical errors along the way, and they took the tactical errors and blew them out of proportion. He didn't understand the nature of the fight in which he was engaged. And I use no less than authority on that than the former chief counsel for the Senate Internal Security Subcommittee, Dr. Robert Morris, mm -hmm. who's well, you know, well loved and, uh, and appreciated by every conservative. Now, what it is, though, is knowing how to fight. See, our people, just like going into any kind of a military uh, uh, adventure, you, you wouldn't send a man into a, into a fray against an enemy unless you, first of all, have him trained in knowing how to handle himself. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that we have to, to do. But once our pe people understand the nature of the fight, they become very good at it. Let me we can talk about communism. In fact, that there's uh, one of the surveys taken by the Los Angeles Times Mirror recently showed that 72% of the American public is strongly anti-communist. Mm -hmm. So it's not a dead subject in any sense of the imagination. As they get closer to this country, it's going to be more of, a, of an interesting subject. Let me ask you something, Senator. Let's say if uh, Marlon Maddox or John Smith, in some particular case, uh, had a confrontation, let's say, with a politician over an issue in their district, uh, as a tactician, strategist, could uh, I fly to your office or you come here or spend some time on the phone, discuss the issue and the things to be discussed, and you outline a way to win? Oh, sure. Is that right? Oh, I do that all the time. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I do that all the time. In fact, uh, <clears throat> this is an interesting question, Marlon, because I'm thinking right now of putting together a, uh, a four, tape, four tapes, four videotapes uh, on how to wage an effective campaign from is structuring how to how to handle this uh, discussion how to handle the media how to take advantage of the media really and uh, to be able to get your message through uh, how to lay out a, a structure a winning structure in a given area things to do things not to do because most people today when they go out and hire a consultant it cost them an arm and a leg mm -hmm. and they can't afford it for some of the l less expensive races so i've been heavily contemplating putting all of that on film since i have a film production company and um, and I, I don't know how quickly I should get into it. Do you think there would be an interest in that? I, I think there would be. I think it may take a little education on the part of the people because I don't think they're aware that this kind of information, number one, is available, and secondly, I don't, I don't think most people know that it's needed. They think if I just go in and be honest with these people, uh, honesty and right's going to win out. Well, that's a, that's a problem, but they find out in a hurry that doesn't work. It doesn't, doesn't work that work. way. That's right. And uh, then our people get frustrated and back off since they got burned. They don't try again. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's too bad. You've got to, you've got to be tenacious. If there's anything I've learned in this business is tenacity. I, I think hang it, in there. I think it would be great. I'd like to hear from you when you get that put together. Yeah, well, I'm trying to figure out uh, how, how soon I should get at it, Marlon. What you should do is maybe ask your audience, see what their response would be, if, if, if there would be any interest in uh, something like that. All right, that'd be a good idea. Drop me a line, and I'll pass it on to the Senate. Yeah, I appreciate it. Boston, Massachusetts. Hi, John. Hi, Marlon. Hello, Bill. Hi, John. Uh, I know I've been listening an hour and a half here, waiting on the phone, so give me a minute here. I know you don't have much time left. 
so that uh, I can just give you what's on the front page of the Boston Globe today. Okay. Pretty amazing story. It has to do, uh, you know, I heard you earlier uh, talking about how we as Christian conservatives should not really focus on the presidency, Bill. But uh, I have to say that uh, I disagree there. I think we should very much focus on it, particularly with someone like uh, Dukakis, who's really radical left, someone who is uh, pro-abortion and pro-gay rights I mean, to the nth degree. Um, this is what it says on the front page of today's Globe. I don't know if you realize this about Dukakis. He grew up as a very much a, a, a very much orthodox Christian, married a Jewish lady, and it appears as if he's actually converted to Judaism. And his wife, and the, they are saying today in the paper that once they're in the White House, they're going to be celebrating uh, all the Jewish holy days. They're going to be bringing in the first Passover, Seder, all the Seders in the White House, uh, the rabbis into the White House. Very unusual, just that to have a Christian who would, in effect, reject Christ, renounce or denounce Christ, and convert to Judaism. There's nothing wrong with Judaism. There should have been a Jewish president a long time ago and all that. I'm just saying it's very unusual for a Christian as Kitty says, Michael celebrates all the Jewish holy days and holidays, goes to synagogue with her, they have three Jewish children, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just saying it's pretty unusual, and I just thought the American people might like to know uh, the truth. Oh, well, I, don't, I don't think that, that would be un, that's unusual for a politician to do that. Uh, the Jewish vote in the United States is a very, very key vote, uh, especially in the Democratic Party, since it's predominantly a Democratic vote. They are also... Uh, probably, uh, of any one given group, that financially contributes more than anybody else. And uh, Jackson's, uh, Jackson's position on, to the Jewish community is an anathema. And so Dukakis is doing nothing but consolidating, uh, uh, probably consolidating his, uh, uh, his, his, uh, stand, uh, his position by vis-a-vis -vis that method. Now, that, that is, uh, that's typical of liberality, though. Um, tomorrow of standing in front of the Catholic Church shaking hands as they're coming out would get him national news, I'm sure it would be contemplated. Bill, I wish I had more time, but uh, the clock on the wall, as we say on radio. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like one more time before I leave to remind you of the Point of View Book of the Month, and it is You Can Trust the Communist to Be Communist by Dr. Fred Swartz, and the chapter on dialectics it's you know it's something everybody in america ought to read it's kind of what bill's been talking about today get a copy of it it's yours at our cost to get it out to you for three dollars and fifty cents if you'd like to get the two tapes with dr bill i'm sorry dr fred swartz uh, enclose a gift of 1350 we'll send you the two tapes and the book the announcer is going to give you my address please write to me i'd love to hear from you until tomorrow, this is Marlon Maddox. So long, everybody. You have been listening to Point of View Radio Talk Show via satellite from Dallas, Texas. Please address your letters to Marlon Maddox, Post Office Box 30. That's Box 30, Dallas, Texas, 75221. Zip 75221. Please enclose your tax-deductible gift when you write. Point of View is produced by International Christian Media.